Hey class, welcome back to World History 2. I hope everyone is doing well today. In today's lecture, we'll be continuing our look with the Renaissance. Last time we looked at Renaissance Part 1, and we finished up with some Renaissance art. And today we're going to continue on with Renaissance art and look in, a little more uh, deeply into uh, the art of the Renaissance. As I mentioned before, I almost minored in art history uh, for my bachelor's degree. Uh, instead, my schedule worked out and I was able to take one more anthropology course, and I minored in anthropology for my bachelor's degree. Uh, but I do enjoy art history and I like the medieval and Renaissance art. And so we're going to be looking at uh, that type of art in more detail today. Stay tuned for the power. Okay, class, we're now going to move into the Renaissance part two. And like I said, we are now going to focus on Renaissance art. What is new about Renaissance art compared to medieval art? We have five areas that we'll, uh, that we will definitely view and see uh, within the art that we're going to look at here today. The Renaissance art is much more lifelike and realistic. Number two, it has a focus on the human body and making sure the human body actually looks human and in perspective. Number three, there's the correct perspective of the, the elements, the things that are taking place in the art and depth. So uh, you're not, it's not going to be as flat and things are going to be uh, the right proportion. And you'll definitely see that here uh, coming up. Uh, number four, there's a lot more vivid colors. Most medieval art uh, was, uh, was basically the basic colors. It'd be reds, blues, greens. But now you're in Renaissance art, you're going to get a lot different uh, vivid colors. And then number five, uh, there's the use of light and shadows, and uh, you'll definitely see that coming up. I'll point, I'll point these things out as we go through uh, some of the artwork today. Uh, the style of painting, sculpture, and decorative arts identified with the Renaissance emerged in Italy in the late 14th century, and it reached its zenith in the late 15th and 16th centuries. So even though the Middle Ages were coming to an end in the 14th and 15th centuries, uh, the early... Renaissance time period is kind of a transition time and and you'll see kind of a mixture between the medieval and the Renaissance art style but later on in the Renaissance 15th and 16th centuries uh, you start really getting the artwork that you may think of uh, with the Renaissance like we looked at last time uh, such as uh, the Mona Lisa or um, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel so uh, there is a kind of a transition uh, time period uh, between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in regards to the art. In addition to its expression of classical Greco-Roman traditions, Renaissance art sought to capture the experience of the individual and the beauty and mystery of the natural world. So you're going to start seeing a lot of emotion in the people's faces that are painted and the, the uh, events that are taking place in the painting. Uh, you'll see it's, it's, there's movement and there's emotion and you can almost like uh, feel how the people are in um, uh, in the painting. And also there's uh, different things with the natural world uh, that you'll see also. So here's a um, an image I've used before in my classes, uh, but it's a, it's a medieval uh, painting. And um, you just notice the perspective. It's very flat. Uh, the human body is very disproportionate. Um, the student on the right, just notice his, his right knee. So here's, it's basically a teacher teaching a student. And this is the student over here. And it's just like this right knee. Let me get my pen going here so I can draw on it. You, you see right here, his right knee is like very, uh, like a bulge. It's almost like the artist has turned the leg. So you're looking at the front of the kneecap. But then it goes down and the foot turns to be completely flat against the floor. Um, the size of the feet are very small. The calf is way down here by the ankle. I mean, it's just like the limbs, if this is his hip up here, the limbs are very long. Um, it's very flat. He's writing here on, a, on a, some sort of a podium or a table and the artist wants you to see it. So he, the artist has put the table kind of up in the air, like flat. So you, you're looking at the top of the table, like it's standing up. The book goes completely off the side. You did, there's no ending to the book. Uh, this student is very talented at writing because he's writing with both hands at the same time. So you see the, the pens uh, here in, writing at the same time. You just, so you just see this. Uh, then over here, the, the neck is very long. If this is the shoulder and this is the base of the neck, Okay, so this is the guy, I mean, just very long. His finger, extremely long. And again, um, the artist wants you to see the 
front of the man as he sits. And so he's kind of like turned in his chair, but the feet are not turned. Okay, so you're kind of looking at the front of his legs in front here. He's kind of turned towards you, but his feet are not. Uh, the book is standing up on end uh, up here. The podium is standing up on end. So you see that um, it's very flat. Also, there's not much emotion going on. There's not much movement. I mean, you can tell that this guy's writing and he's leaning his head forward and there's a pointing finger. You can kind of see some eye expression, but it's not really... Um, really uh, drawing you in to really feel uh, the emotion compared to this. This is called The Descent of the Cross, 1435 by van der Weyden. Now, this painting here is earlier Renaissance. This is early 15th century. And it, it, there is some elements of flatness to this also. It's a very small space from the front of the dress to the back of the cross where this ladder is. But you have a bunch of people crammed in there. So there's kind of a, a small space and it's kind of like a flattened kind of a look. But you definitely see Renaissance characteristics of this painting. Uh, you can see the folds and the, the shadows of the dresses and the capes. Um, you can see the folds and shadows of the loincloth of Jesus. You can see the emotion in people's faces. So the, uh, there, there's a fainting here and, and crying up here and mourning over here. And the guy that has just bringing Jesus down. Um, you can see the emotion in their face. You can see the, the uh, detail of the body, the caved in belly uh, here, the rib cage the spear wound here on Jesus' side, you can see the detail of the crown of thorns. So you just see um, a lot more detail than the previous painting, which was that. Even though you see some folds here and there is some shadowing, it's still very flat. But here it's not so much. Also you can see Renaissance clothing. Uh, this is not the kind of clothing that uh, they would have worn during Jesus' day, the man with tights and a sandal with a, uh, this uh, shoe with a little strap on it, and a Renaissance coat. This is Renaissance uh, attire uh, back here. And so that's another thing that you will see. You see biblical characters wearing Renaissance clothing. Okay, so we were looking at some of the uh, artists earlier in the previous PowerPoint. Now we're going to go in a little more detail uh, into them. Uh, this is Michelangelo. His entire name is Michelangelo, and there's the rest of it there. Uh, you can pronounce that on your own. Uh, because I'm not exactly sure how to even pronounce it uh, without uh, stumbling over all over it. Uh, but that's his full name. But we call him Michelangelo. Uh, he painted the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling of it. It's one of the most famous painted interior spaces in the world. The chapel was built in 1479 by Pope Sixtus IV, and that's why it's called the Sistine Chapel, because it was built by Pope Sixtus. And it's near St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican in, uh, in Rome. And it's used as the gathering place for cardinals of the Catholic Church to gather together and then to elect the next pope. And they still use it today for choosing of the next pope. So there's a picture there of the Sistine Chapel. And the ceiling is this right here, painted by Michelangelo, 1508 to 1512. And this um, PowerPoint slide does not do it justice, of course. It's very blurry because I try to cram it all in one little slide. Uh, but each one is... A, a biblical scene. And so right here in the center you see uh, God touching uh, the finger of Adam. And that's the very famous uh, two fingers touching. But here's a diagram of what these scenes are. So here God creates Adam and then God creates Eve. Adam and Eve are tempted and are sent to, uh, out of Eden. Noah and his family make the sacrifice after the flood. You see the great flood. Noah is drunk and disgraced. And you can just kind of go around and start seeing the different uh, aspects of the Sistine Chapel. So over here in the corner, um, right up in here, Moses raises up the bronze serpent. Um, and then on the side aisles, you begin to see other things that are uh, painted. Uh, you see uh, Salmon Bow as an Obed. You see different uh, personalities. Here's Jacob and Joseph over here on the left. Okay, so you can just kind of go around and hear Jesse, David, and Solomon. So you see a lot of different scenes and other things going on. 
Um, over here on this side, I should have mentioned it earlier, uh, God divides the water from the earth, God creates the sun, God divides the light from the darkness. Here's Jonah. So there's a lot of different scenes going on in this massive ceiling that Michelangelo painted. Here's the creation of Adam is a better picture. So this is God the Father on the right and then Adam on the left. But again, what my... my uh, point with the Renaissance art is you you can see the muscle tone and you can see the um, the human body and and the form of the human body up here you see the cherubs and you see the, the different muscle tones in the cherubs. We'll look here now at um, Michelangelo's uh, images of God the Father and there are several of them on the Sistine Chapel. This is three of them. You can see the movement in God the Father's hair. And of course, God the Father is spirit, and Michelangelo has personified God the Father and has made him look like a, a grandfather type of a figure. Uh, but this is his representation of God the Father. And you see the flow and the movement. You see the intensity in, in God the Father's eyes up here and um, the flow and movement of the hair of the beard and the flow and movement of the of the cloak and the the... Um, just the fabric folds uh, all here. So again, this is Michelangelo's art, and we know that the Bible says God is spirit, God the Father is spirit, but uh, he has uh, made images of God the Father on the Sistine Chapel. Okay, so we'll continue on here with Michelangelo. Um, this is his La Pieta, 1498 to 1499, and this is in St. Peter's Basilica also in Vatican City. It's five feet eight inches tall, so it's almost, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, the same size as a, as a person would be. It's Mary holding Jesus, and this is carved from one slab of marble, which is just unbelievable for the time period, but he carved it, and you can just see the, uh, the folds in the fabric, the muscle tone, uh, the, the body, the fingers, the hands, um, the blank expression on uh, Mary's face, which is almost uh, to a point of mourning, but she's holding the, the dead body of Christ. Uh, this artwork, this sculpture that he carved, actually led to the commissioning of him carving uh, the David statue, because he carved this earlier on, and uh, it was so, so well done that uh, he was commissioned to uh, carve the David statue. This is the only work that he ever signed, and it's actually an interesting story uh, behind it. Uh, he was standing around the statue. After it was done, he was standing there while a whole bunch of people were there admiring the completed work. And he overheard one man say to another man, who carved this? And the answer was given, it was actually incorrect. The answer that was given, the man said, Gobo of Milan carved it. So he gave credit to the wrong person. Well, Michelangelo was very upset that this work was attributed to somebody else. And so one night he snuck into the basilica and with a small lantern and a chisel and chisels, he carved his name into the uh, La Pieta. But afterwards, he regretted this show of vanity. He was basically saying he felt guilty that he was showing vanity by getting upset over this and, and carving his own name in it. And he resolved to never sign another piece of art again. So that's La Pieta. And then we have David, 1501 to 04, 17 feet tall, so very tall. And again, uh, the, the, because the statue is so much taller than the human body, uh, one may think of this time period, it would be out of perspective or some sort of an issue with that, but it was not. He actually mathematically uh, structured the statue of David so that everything was in perspective. The length of the limbs was correct for that size of a statue, and uh, just the, uh, the carving of the muscle tone and of the hair and uh, other aspects of the body, uh, just very, very accurate. This is in a cathedral in Florence, Italy today. It's used a massive block of marble that sat for 40 years at a marble quarry. So it's just a huge block of marble sitting there, and 40 years later it is picked up to be carved, and uh, there it is, um, Michelangelo carved this great work of art. It depicts David resembling a Greco-Roman style carving. Uh, he used geometry and symmetry uh, for the proper scale of such a huge piece. And it's the Renaissance ideal, ideal 
for a perfect humanity. So again, the figure, the human body and the figure was very important to the Renaissance. Uh, they were uh, focused on uh, the human body and humanity to really come across as a realistic looking piece of art. And uh, this is the ideal of it. Here's another one, Michelangelo. Uh, he carved this statue of Moses, 1513 to 1515. It's about eight feet tall, so a little, little taller than a person. Uh, about as tall as uh, the standard uh, room in your house is about eight feet tall. It's um, at the Church of St. Peter in Chains in Rome, Italy. And Michelangelo actually considered this to be his most important work because it was originally supposed to be part of the tomb of Pope Julius II. And so to be able to uh, carve a statue that would be part of a tomb of a pope would be a great honor. And so he took uh, this to be as his most important work. It has uh, two horns on Moses' head based on the Latin Vulgate Bible translation of Exodus 34, 29. And you can kind of see the horns there on top of his head uh, up here. I'll circle them with my pen. There's two horns up here. And the next slide, we'll look at that here. So you see the horns uh, right up there. And uh, the translation for the Vulgate, it says this, And when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai, he held the two tablets of the testimony, and he knew not that his face was horned from the convert conversation of the Lord. And so uh, most translations is that he did not know that his face was glowing or something like that. Well, uh, the Vulgate translated it as horned. And so Michelangelo actually carved Moses with two horns coming out of the top of his head. So that's um, uh, one of his uh, statues there. I mean, just look at the, the detail of the beard, uh, the, the movement of the hair of the beard coming down, and then obviously the, the cloak. Just beautiful art. Okay, so now we're going to move on to Leonardo da Vinci, 1452 to 1519. Uh, he's the ultimate Renaissance man. Uh, he was a solitary genius whose branch of study was very vast. He studied art, science, anatomy, and engineering. And so we have a term down there highlighted in yellow for you called a polymath. And a polymath is a person whose expertise spans a significant number of different subjects. And so the difference between a polymath and someone that just like knows a lot about different things is that a polymath is basically an expert in these things. Like he could basically, he could have had a PhD in art, a PhD in science, a PhD in anatomy, and a PhD in engineering. I mean, he was that kind of a, of a man. I mean, we all have different interests and we might know a lot about different things and be able to teach other people different things. Uh, but he was basically a polymath that had, he was an expert in these different areas. And uh, just one more thing, that picture there on the right, that's a self-portrait. So he drew that of himself. I mean, I can't imagine sitting down and, I mean, I can barely draw a stick figure. Uh, he's there drawing a whole picture of himself. Okay, here's a look at his um, drawings of anatomy. And so... You see these, these are actually his drawings and his notes. And of course, it's not, they didn't have the, the scientific advances that we have in modern day today. Uh, but it was just this idea coming out of the, the Middle Ages of getting in and, and looking at anatomy. And so he's got the brain up here, but he's got these different, like, kind of like lines. I guess they're uh, nerves or something going to the eyes. And, and obviously, the brain stem is a lot bigger than this. You know, we know that for sure. He's got the spinal cord coming right out of the brain and says there's no brain stem. Uh, he's taken off the skull cap here and you have the brain and the eyes and all of these like little lines or nerves coming down out of the brain. It wasn't perfect. He didn't know everything that we know about the brain today, but it's just definitely amazing how he was able to put this stuff down onto paper and, um, and show uh, anatomy. Uh, this art here, very familiar, you've probably seen it before, it's called Vitruvian Man. It's uh, basically uh, the image for humanism where man is the center of the universe and man, is, this is uh, the Vitruvian Man, he, the circle is the universe and he's basically touching the edges of the circle with his feet and his hands. But uh, just a, a good look there of the human body. And over here on the right we see his uh, drawings of uh, the baby in the womb. And again, they didn't have x-rays. They didn't have uh, the ultrasounds. They didn't have any of that. And so he uh, he was drawing this and very, very accurate to how a baby might be forming and be uh, curled up in the womb. He was also an expert in engineering. And these are two images of his um, 
uh, basically his flying machines is what he called them. And uh, the first one is like a bird. He took the images of how a bird would fly. And so the man would uh, lay down in here and then these would be the wings and there would be a structure of like, kind of like a wings for a bird on these arms and the, they would go up and down and then the person would be able to fly. Of course it would never work, uh, but uh, it was just this idea of actually designing something off of, uh, off of nature, off of the bird. Uh, this was called the flying corkscrew, and he had this idea of a man could be in the center of it. It would twist it up and then release, and it would, it's, uh, basically would fly. And it's almost kind of like an idea of a helicopter. Continuing on with his engineering, these are some fighting vehicles uh, that he uh, designed. This was called the War Scythe. Uh, at the top and basically it was uh, a horseman would be dragging and pushing uh, this machine and you see the scythe that's what is used to cut down wheat and the horseman would ride into the soldiers the enemy soldiers and the scythes would be spinning and it would basically uh, cut the feet and legs down of the soldiers so a pretty gruesome kind of a vehicle but uh, this was his design uh, for war and then also this primitive kind of a tank uh, and basically this would be, this is the upside down portion of it and this is the right side up portion. And you had these wheels with these like turning handles and the soldiers would, a couple of soldiers would be underneath of there cranking on these handles for the wheels to go. And they could move across the battlefield and the arrows uh, from the enemy soldiers would bounce off and they would be protected inside. So it was kind of an idea of, a, of the early tank. We wouldn't get the tank uh, in battle until the 20th century with World War I. So again, this is very early on thinking. And to sit down and actually design this, it just really shows uh, his, his depth of imagination and, and his depth of uh, progress with engineering. He was also an artist. Um, two most famous works are the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. Uh, the Mona Lisa, 1503 to 1505, it's the most famous painting in the world. The estimated value of it is $800 million in 2019. And it's believed to be uh, Lisa Gherardini, and that is a wife of a wealthy clo cloth merchant. And so that's who the um, it's believed that that person is. And there's all kinds of different guesses of who it might have been, uh, but... Uh, many people say it's this uh, this woman who is the wife of a wealthy cloth merchant. And then the Last Supper, 1498. Uh, this is a mural in the convent of Santa Maria in Milan. Uh, it's Milan's most famous mural, and it is not even in a very conspicuous space. And you have seen this, I'm sure, many, many times, uh, the Last Supper. Uh, but it is not like on some primary wall in the cathedral or, or anything like that or the convent. It's, it's basically uh, off to the side. Uh, there's a doorway in the convent from the, basically from the sanctuary uh, to a smaller side room. And it's uh, basically in this doorway is where the uh, Last Supper is painted. But it's very famous. Uh, it depicts several seconds after Jesus declared one of them, uh, Judas, uh, would betray uh, Jesus. And so Jesus has just said, one of you will betray me, which is Judas and everyone's discussing really quick who's it going to be. Okay, so here's Da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi. Uh, 1500 is when he painted this. Uh, da Vinci painted uh, Jesus in Renaissance period clothing. So you see that clothing there of Jesus. That's not um, uh, first century Jewish clothing. Uh, this would be Renaissance. Uh, you can see the emotion uh, there. Uh, as Jesus is giving the benediction, you can see the movement in the hair of the curls, the um, the different uh, folds of the fabric. Uh, the right hand is giving a benediction. The left hand is holding an orb, which signifies the, that Jesus is the master of the cosmos. Uh, this painting sold for $450 million, uh, just over $450 million, in 2017, and it is housed in the Louvre in Paris. Okay, so now we're going to move on to Raphael, and you see his entire name there. Raphael. He learned to paint from his father. He used bright, vivid colors. Uh, he used many cherubs, and a lot of the um, images of cherubs that are today with a little baby with the wings and the harp and all of that, uh, that comes from Raphael's view of cherubs. He would paint cherubs like that. Uh, he definitely had a false perception of angels, and um, uh, he's best known for his Madonnas. 
which are Mary. Uh, he would, he's best known for those paintings. He's known for his Neoplatonic ideal of human grandeur, and Neoplatonism is a philosophical ideal. And it was found in the third century by Plotinus, and it basically states existence exists from emanations from the one with whom the soul is united. And it's kind of, uh, it gets into mysticism, especially um, uh, mysticism that uh, influenced Christianity. So it's just a a philosophical ideal uh, of that time period, and um, it's not really followed today, uh, but it definitely influenced uh, mysticism in Christianity. Okay, so this is Raphael's Alba Madonna, 1510. It's a three-foot round painting, and it depicts Mary, Jesus, and John the Baptist. Uh, Jesus is accepting the cross uh, from John the Baptist. So the John the Baptist here is the, the smaller boy, the toddler maybe, uh, wearing this animal skin, and he's handing the cross to Jesus. And uh, this is actually in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. So you see Mary there with a book holding Jesus as he takes the cross from John the Baptist. What's interesting about this picture is that, first off, Mary is holding a book, um, not a scroll or anything like that, uh, so definitely a bound book. She also has a kind of Renaissance uh, kind of uh, clothing on and uh, sandals. And then also in the background here, you have um, a small little castle, which would definitely be uh, from a Renaissance time period. So you, you start seeing these uh, Renaissance elements coming into images of uh, biblical times. Here's Raphael's Entombment, 1507. This is a six foot by five foot painting, and it's in Rome. And the picture really here doesn't do it justice that I took off the internet. It's kind of blurry a little bit. Uh, but Jesus is being bring brought down uh, from the uh, cross, and he's going to be put down into the tomb. And the reason I brought this uh, image on here was uh, the looking at the Renaissance clothing, especially this, uh, this figure here, uh, definitely wearing Renaissance clothing um, in, the, in the image. Okay, uh, Donatello. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, Donatello, you see his entire name there, 1386 to 1466, so he's earlier Renaissance. Uh, his most famous sculpture is the Bronze David uh, there on the right. And again, this is uh, David as a young man, uh, maybe uh, late teens, and uh, you see the hat he's wearing. That's, that's a Renaissance uh, hat right there, and he's uh, holding the sword of Goliath uh, there in his right hand. And then we get to this man. He's is a very interesting painter. His name is uh, Caravaggio. You see his entire name there, uh, uh, second bullet point. Uh, he's 1571 to 1610, and uh, he's famous for his large-scale biblical scenes, and many times they're bloody and dramatic scenes. Um, one interesting uh, thing about him is that he murdered a man in 1606, and uh, he was uh, possibly over a gambling debt. So Caravaggio, he fled and was a fugitive the rest of his life. And while he was a fugitive, that's when he did most of his paintings. So it's just amazing how this guy could paint like this while on the run. A lot of his paintings are uh, dark. And not just dark in regards to the content, but also just dark in regards to the color. Uh, he uses very dark pigment uh, to paint. This is David with the head of Goliath, 1610, uh, oil on canvas. And so you see David there uh, holding the head of Goliath, and you see all the, the blood and gore coming out the bottom of the, the neck there of Goliath, and he's holding, as David holds the sword. But he, he uses a lot of um, shadows, and he uses a lot of uh, uh, folds and different things. I mean, and you can see the emotion uh, on David's face. You definitely see the emotion on the dead Goliath's uh, face uh, there. Just an amazing uh, use of, of paint and... Uh, and color. Okay, so we have Hans Holbein the Younger, 1497 to 1543. He was a German artist, and he painted Henry VIII in 1540, uh, probably the most famous painting of Henry VIII there in the center. There's great detail of the of the robe and the costume there that Henry VIII is uh, wearing, and that's that's Hans there on the right. Hans Holbein the Younger also painted Erasmus of Rotterdam, 1523. We looked at this image earlier in the last PowerPoint. Uh, but here we have Erasmus, a uh, book uh, his hands are on is the Latin uh, New Testament. So you have um, just a lot of detail there in the fur 
and in the hands and in his face. Okay, so that is it for Renaissance Part 2. I do hope you enjoyed this look at uh, Renaissance art. I find it quite interesting, and it's a very important transition from the Middle Ages into the Ren Renaissance is the look at the Renaissance art. I'll see you in a second. Okay, class, that is it for uh, Renaissance Part 2. Uh, next time, we're going to begin our look at exploration and the explorers. I'll see you then.